Donna Beckman, the Agassiz and Outreach Director for the North Carolina Down Syndrome Alliance, or the NCDSA. I'd like to welcome you to the North Carolina Down Syndrome Virtual Speaker Series, which is hosted by NCDSA, along with Coastal Buds, the Down Syndrome Network of Onslow and Carteret Counties, the Down Syndrome Network of Greater Greensboro, the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Winston-Salem, the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Charlotte, and the High Country Buddy Walk. I'd like to remind everybody that the North Carolina Virtual Speaker Series is held monthly on the third Wednesday of each month at 7.30. It is free for all who register in advance. Registration for the sessions open up the first of the month, the month prior to the presentation. So at this point in December, you can now register for the January session. Registration closes the Monday night before the presentation so that we can get you the login information. I'd like to thank everyone for your patience as we incorporate the new technology. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and barring any issues with the technology, you will receive a follow-up email hopefully next week. Uh, we have the holidays coming up, but the email will contain the link to the video as well as the PowerPoint slides. I'd like to remind everyone to please take just one minute, barely a minute, to answer the questions that are in the brief survey that was included in the email you receive, received with the link to tonight's meeting. Um, we have question and answers will be held until the end of the presentation. We do know that because not everyone has Teams or the full feature of Teams, your Q&A feature might not work. If that is the case, please text the number that was in the email that was sent to you with tonight's login information. If you don't have that, um, I'll recite it right here. The number is 919-532-9207. I will add that to the chat, which I cannot guarantee you will have access to as well. So tonight, our webinar is Unraveling Down Syndrome and Autism, presented by Dr. Lena Patel. With the, she is an associate professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. I'd like to welcome Dr. Patel and thank her for sharing her expertise on this very important subject. Um, you know why we're here and who our presenter is. So I'd like Dr. Patel to introduce herself, tell us what she does and why she's so excited to do that. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Donna. Um, so as Donna said, my name is Dr. Lena Patel. I'm a pediatric psychologist. Um, I started working in child and adolescent psychi psychology in um, way back in the day, but really with the general population. And then I really realized that my passion was working with kids with neurodiverse um, presentations and um, kind of fell into working with kids with Down syndrome um, over a decade ago and just fell in love with, um, you know, the population, the families and really getting to kind of work side by side with families to um, really su provide support to a population who I feel like a lot of times don't get the same um, support that kids with autism or kids with other neurogenetic conditions do. So um, I have worked with over 900 um, families and people with Down syndrome birth to 25. And I actually now do research as well um, in with adults with Down syndrome, um, looking at conditions like Down syndrome regression disorder, uh, looking at skin conditions in Down syndrome, and really offering my expertise in um, the clinical psychology realm and in the cognitive assessment realm. So I, I'm so happy to be here and I'm hoping that I can give you guys a lot of information. Um, I hope it's not overwhelming for some people. They like kind of the the research, um, you know, elements of it. For other people, they're kind of like, that's not, um, you know, uh, my primary method of learning. And so hopefully I, my presentation is kind of a mixture of both. You guys will have access to these slides. So hopefully that will give you an opportunity to kind of like mull over the information and, um, you know, come back with questions um, if you have them. Um, I can't actually see the chat. So the best method I think is to save questions till the end. But if you're like me and you sometimes forget your question, um, it's completely okay to either write it down and then say it out loud when we're um, in the question and answer portion or typing it into the chat. So let's go ahead and get started. 
So what I'm going to talk about is um, a couple of different things. First, I'm going to provide an overview of co-occurring Down syndrome and autism and how it's diagnosed. We're going to talk about identifying areas of challenge faced by individuals with Down syndrome and autism. We're going to talk about strategies to address challenge, these challenges that are faced by individuals with Down syndrome and autism. And I'm going to talk about recommendations for support, services, accommodations, and modifications um, that really should be considered to help a person who has Down syndrome and autism um, be successful in, in different environments. So I always like to start with this in whatever presentation that I'm doing because I think it's really fascinating information when you're thinking about Down syndrome alone. At or just before birth, the brain of an individual with Down syndrome is almost indistinguishable from the brain of individuals without any genetic um, differences. So what that means is, is that right when a person with Down syndrome is born, if you were doing brain imaging, you really wouldn't see any differences. The neuropathological differences we do see really don't start until about three to five months of age, and then we de see definite differences by six months. I'm talking about Down syndrome specifically first because I'm going to break down the autism piece and kind of that, um, you know, uh, added diagnostic picture. But I want to give you guys a sense of kind of some of the presentations we see with Down syndrome first. Once mature, the brain of a person with Down syndrome are, um, is about 20% smaller than average. It has fewer neurons and it has what we call abnormal connections between the cells. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. That's not going to be throughout the whole brain, but specific parts of the brain are going to have um, difficulties in communicating from one part to the other. And we're going to see fewer neurons in that area and we're going to have, um, you know, uh, degeneration in those areas as well. So when we look at the brain, there's three primary areas of the brain that are impacted in this, you know, volume and circuitry place. So if you think about it, the way that I like to think about brain connections is, is that you have this neuron A and neuron B, and there's information that's being sent from A to B. For people with Down syndrome in these specific parts of the brain, we notice that the information is much slower um, with traveling from point A to point B. It's less effective, so it's takes long, you know, it takes longer, not just from the neuroconnectivity piece, but it just the neurons aren't like in a you know sequential order. So it's not a direct communication. And so that makes it take longer as well. And then this process called myelination that um, impacts the speed of transmission of information is also impacted. So the three parts of the brain that are impacted are the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and the cerebellum promise you, you don't have to remember all of these names in detail, but I want to explain to you a little bit about the purpose of these parts of the brain, because I think it really helps with kind of showing why we see certain presentations in a person with Down syndrome, and then kind of, again, how that's added on to by a person who has um, autism as well. So the hippocampus is responsible for memory and learning. When we're talking about memory, we're talking about things like remembering multiple step directions. So holding information in your brain, processing it and then executing the steps without somebody having to repeat to you again what the um, steps were. So say I give somebody a two-step direction. For people with Down syndrome, it may be much more difficult for them to remember both pieces of information and then executing them. They might just do the last part because that's what's the most recent information that they've received. And so if that happens, then we might say, oh my gosh, they're not listening or they're not following directions. But in fact, it's because that their brain, um, the hippocampus just can't hold that um, information, uh, you know, as, as easily as for somebody who doesn't have this same neurodevelopmental difference. The other piece is, is that it's harder to kind of pull information from long-term memory um, in your file folder system. So when you have somebody um, tell you something and you hold it in your memory, you learn it, learn it, learn it, and then you file it into long-term memory, right? Into your file folder of long-term memory. That allows you to go back in and pull that file and then say, okay, this is the information that I need for this specific situation. That whole process is much more difficult for a person with Down syndrome. Then we talk about the prefrontal cortex. That's this front part of the brain. The front part of the brain is kind of like the CEO of your brain. So it's responsible for things like planning, decision making, problem solving, regulating your emotions, stopping yourself from doing something dangerous. So inhibiting your impulses um, and modulating social behaviors. So, you know, um, what do I do when I meet a stranger? How do I interact? Um, how do I know when a group of people are talking, um, how 
you know, I shouldn't jump in and interrupt, but maybe stand close to the outside of the circle. So like really navigating those social behaviors. Um, so lots of important pieces, impulse control, decision making, problem solving, organizing yourself. So you can already hear how much that would be impacted in day to day functioning if your prefrontal cortex is not working at its you know, optimum. Um, cerebellum is the third part of the brain. It's this piece in the very, very back, um, and it's responsible for coordination, movement and learning, as well as attention and language. For the movement piece, we talked about how the circuitry is different in the brain of a person with Down syndrome. So they're processing information more slowly. And then once they process that information, then their body has to actually tell you know, the cerebellum to, okay, now you can execute the behavior or the movement that we're looking for. So sometimes, you know, when we see dropping and flopping, for example, um, people are like, you know, why is it that our kids do that more often? I truly believe that part of it is, is that we don't give our kids long enough to process what's happening and that they're creating their own pause, right? If I drop to the ground and I don't understand what I'm being asked to do, um, and I don't know how to coordinate my movements to execute it, this feels like a faster solution in the meantime. Sorry. Um, while these are things that are pretty well established in the Down syndrome community, um, there's still lots more to learn that we haven't quite gotten to yet. So it's important for us to take that into consideration and say, this is not true for every single person to the same degree. Otherwise, everybody with Down syndrome would be exactly the same. And we know that that's not the case. So interestingly enough, neurocircuitry and structure of the brain has also been studied in autism. Um, and within that realm, we actually see things like the hippocampus, the cerebellum, the frontal lobe, the amygdala, co the corpus callosum, temporal lobe, white matter, poor connection versus strong connections based on location in the brain. There's all these pieces of information that have been um, discovered related to brain structural differences in autism, but really there hasn't been a huge consensus that's been reached on like which part you know, is the primary issue. So really, because that consensus hasn't been reached, we're really looking for more pieces of information. But I wanna draw your attention to the fact that the first three, the hippocampus, the cerebellum, and the frontal lobe, um, are, in, are the same areas of the brain that we know are impacted in Down syndrome as well. So here lies a little bit of the conundrum that we're gonna be talking about and why people are a little bit more hesitant on making a diagnosis of autism in a person with Down syndrome. Important to know, just like I said before, that this is what we call a probabilistic behavioral phenotype. So whether it's autism alone or Down syndrome alone, what we know is, is that from years and years and years of research, that the that this is highly likely how these characteristics would manifest or how these brain differences manifest in a person with Down syndrome or in a person with autism. However, again, it's not to the same degree. It's not all in the same manner. Otherwise, we would be saying that everybody was exactly the same, and that's not the case. So some people might have more prefrontal cortex impact. Some people might have more hippocampal impact. Some people might have more amygdalar impact if you're looking at the autism world. Um, but it's going to be variable depending on who you're working with. So let's talk a little bit about the characteristics. I want to first start with characteristics related to Down syndrome, and then I'm going to go into autism. So there's evidence that children with Down syndrome typically have IQs between 30 to 70. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I'm giving you these as data points, but not something as like to hold on to really tight, because one of the other things that we have to remember is that measures that are used in the general population are not measures that were created specifically to identify the strengths and challenges of a person with Down syndrome. And so what we are estimating these IQs to be between 30 and 70, that's really, um, which is 70 is um, somebody who has an intellectual disability. But why we say that is, is based on, you know, these uh, measures that were created for a person who does not have Down syndrome. Uh, we see a four to five month um, developmental progress per 12 months. So for a person who doesn't have Down syndrome that acquires a certain number of skills in 12 months, um, there's a four to five month, it takes four to five months 
uh, per the 12 months for the person to gain those skills. So act, actually the opposite. So if a person who doesn't have Down syndrome is developing a skills in four to five months, a person with Down syndrome would take 12 months to gain those same same skills. So what we know is, is that this, the skills are occurring and continuing to de develop, but it just takes longer to acquire them. Receptive language um, has been correlated with overall IQ. And so what we note is, is that re receptive language is actually a strength um, compared to expressive language for people with Down syndrome, but that there is research showing that it's correlated with um, IQ. And then we know preferences, you know, that people with Down syndrome have a pre preference for routines, or for specific routines and sameness. The reason I bring these up is because we're going to parallel them to what we see in autism as well. All right, so in the development of Down syndrome, we see relative strengths in things like orienting to a person, engaging to, with a person, even as early as infancy. That means like, you know, if you make a sound, um, a silly sound, it might take the, the baby or the infant a little bit longer to react, but that they will react like you would expect for a child who um, doesn't have Down syndrome, um, which would kind of differentiate them from a person with autism. Um, we know that our kids are socially sensitive and they understand nonverbal cues for emotion. So if I pretended to start crying that, um, you know, a, an infant, a toddler um, would also maybe not know how to react, like they might either start crying themselves or they might have a confused expression on their face. Again, their, their response time might take a little bit longer, but we would still see those types of reactions. Another strength is empathy skills. Our kids with Down syndrome have amazing empathy skills, sometimes to a fault where if somebody else is hurt or if somebody else isn't feeling well, that it can really negatively impact our kids at a much um, greater rate. We know that visual processing of information is a strength um, for people with Down syndrome, self-help and daily living skills. So once a, a routine is learned for doing something independently, that tends to be a strength for our population and visual short-term memory. Um, so memory for like visual images um, for in the immediate short-term can be a relative strength as well. Relative cha challenges in our population include auditory processing. So information that is said to a person and then um, the person's asked to execute it, that's much more challenging for the reasons that I said from the neurodevelopmental perspective. Motivation to learn new topics that are not of interest is a relative challenge for our, our population as well. So then when we look at development in autism, there's evidence that children with autism typically have above um, average to above average intelligence, intelligence with a smaller percentage that have intellectual disability. So a smaller percentage that have IQs in that 30 to 70 um, uh, range that we mentioned um, is present in a person with Down syndrome. They have something called splinter skills, which means when we think of development, we think of like if you, you know, um, have good fine motor skills, then that leads to you being able to do buttons or to being able to type on a computer or things like that. And so splinter skills just means that they don't actually actually happen in any specific order. So sometimes you see a skill that's much more advanced that we don't anticipate a person can have yet, um, but they lack a, a lower level skill um, at the same rate. And so we see a lot more splinter skills in autism. Um, we also see a variability in the level of delay that that um, is present in the person with autism. Um, even average IQ results in a significant challenge with adaptive skills. Adaptive skills are our ability to kind of navigate day to day functioning, dressing, uh, engaging in our community, socializing, any of those types of things. So even if a person with autism has an average IQ, they still have a really difficult time with navigating those day to day tasks. Relative strengths in autism, attention to detail, knowledge for specific areas of interest. So really hyper focusing and having kind of a high level of knowledge in a specific area that they're really, really interested in. Uh, visual processing and verbal communication. I hope you see that there's already are some overlap between um, Down syndrome and autism at this point too. Relative weaknesses in pragmatic communication. So really like reading between the lines in social engagement are really difficult for people with autism. Motivation to learn new topics that are not of interest seems to be a theme uh, with Down syndrome and then with autism separately. 
uh, I'm per perceiving um, people's emotional state. So people with autism have a difficult time kind of understanding a person's um, like what they're feeling um, and are much more concrete. Like they might say you're you're uh, you have water coming from your eyes, but might not understand that that equals sadness or you're crying, but that um, equals sadness. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, sensory integration or sensory processing issues are connected to autism. I would really argue that lots of kids with Down syndrome, in my experience, also have um, sensory issues. It's just that it's not as well researched in um, Down syndrome. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that that's unique to a person with autism. So if you have a child who has sensory issues, that doesn't necessarily mean they have autism. Uh, we look at kind of the full big picture. Generalizing skills from one setting to another is also difficult for um, people with autism and empathy is also difficult for a person with autism. So when we look at Down syndrome and autism together, so as a dual diagnosis, that's the term that we use, um, we notice that for people with Down syndrome and autism that IQs tend to, or developmental quotients, so developmental quotients kind of are like the early precursors of IQ. So what, where are they developmentally? So we see that a person with Down syndrome and autism tends to have lower developmental ability than a person with um, Down syndrome alone. Our kids actually with Down syndrome and autism also tend to score higher on measures of self-absorbed behavior. So compared to kids with Down syndrome, all this means is, is that self-absorbed sounds kind of mean, but what it means is, is that they tend to have a harder time kind of with um, looking outward and engaging with their environment outwardly versus kind of like internally being preoccupied. So really being happy with what I'm doing by myself, but really not necessarily being super aware of what's happening around them. Um, they have more challenges with social relatedness than um, those with Down syndrome alone. So people, social relatedness is kind of, again, that desire to want to be with other people. One of the questions I ask families a lot of the time is, is, you know, how does, how does your child um, engage with you? And a lot of times they say, they, they do great. And then I'll ask the second question, I'll say, how hard do you have to work to get them to interact with you? And to me, if a parent is saying, you know, oh, I have to initiate with them every single time, that's much more concerning for me for a dual diagnosis for Down syndrome and autism than if um, a parent tells me, oh, no, they actually want to be, you know, in the mix. In fact, sometimes I even have a hard time, like, you know, telling them that they have to do something by themselves for a little while. So it's, again, not doesn't mean that equals a, an autism diagnosis. It just means that we have to put that in our kind of red flags um, container. Uh, we see children with Down syndrome and autism are more impaired in shifting their attention. So going, look, you know, focusing on one thing and then shifting their attention to something else, either when somebody asks them to, or even when something else new is introduced. Um, emotional control, so like regulating your emotions and flexibility in problem solving. So people a lot of times will ask, well, so what's the incidence of Down syndrome and autism, you know, and autism as a dual diagnosis? So, you know, we really don't know the answer. I hate to, to say that, but we don't know the answer for a number of reasons. One is because we miss the diagnosis a lot. Um, a lot of times people will say, hopefully from what you've already even seen, that there's overlap between the two populations. And so sometimes people, you know, will be much more quick to say, oh, that's just Down syndrome. Um, it's, you know, and and not consider the, op the option of it being a secondary diagnosis. So we kind of like to say that maybe it's about 20%, 16 to 20% is the latest numbers um, in uh, that would have a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism or a co-occurring condition of Down syndrome and autism. Um, but we don't really know. That's probably our best estimate at this point in time. And what we want to say is that's still dramatically higher than the general population. So it is more likely for a person with Down syndrome to have a secondary diagnosis of, of autism than it would be in the general population for people who don't have Down syndrome. This is just a visual. I don't expect you guys to read it finite, but wanted to provide it as kind of a, a reference tool um, for um, you know a later point in time. But just this is a great visual, and I apologize. I actually don't know where it came from, but I love it. Um, but it really just shows you the difference between autism. So autism's the orange, or sorry, the yellow circle. 
Down syndrome is the blue circle, and then this grayish white circle in the or space in the middle is what are the things that overlap between Down syndrome and autism. And those are the symptom presentations that actually make it much more difficult to also um, say, like, you know, whether a person has a secondary diagnosis of autism or not, because there are some things that do overlap, which we're going to talk about too. So Speaking of what makes it difficult to diagnose autism and Down syndrome, first is communication. We know that kids with Down syndrome sometimes have an abnormal social approach to people. Um, I've had lots of kids who come into the office and want to sit in my lap or hug me um, the first time that they, they met me. Now, that doesn't mean that they have autism. That doesn't mean that they don't understand social, um, you know, the social dynamics. Uh, for the same reason they that they're having those challenges for the same reason that a person with autism would, but it is something that makes it more challenging for people to differentiate the two. We know that our kids, because they have communication challenges, aren't able to have back and forth conversations. That's one of the criteria related to an autism diagnosis. So if somebody's not having a back and forth conversation and you just said yes or no to that, you would be maybe say, oh, they must have um, you know, autism because they don't have back and forth conversations. But the reality is, is it because of that, like an underlying social engagement issue, or is it because of their challenges with expressive communication? So we have to kind of tease that out. We know that our kids sometimes have a reduction of sharing of interests and emotions or affect. Um, and that's, again, because of limitations with communication ability and not necessarily that that they're not um, wanting to have that level of, of communication. Intellectual disability. So while I don't like thinking about it from a, the perspective of IQ, what I do like to think about it is, is what makes a, a person who has an intellectual disability have difficulty with engaging in their surroundings. So if you have an intellectual disability, you might have difficulty with adjusting your behavior to suit different social contexts. So if you're at a library, how do you behave? If you're at a sporting event, how do you behave? That may be a little bit more difficult to switch back and forth with um, or to when you have an intellectual disability. When you have an intellectual disability, you also have difficulty with imaginative play. This is a criteria related to having a diagnosis of autism. However, people who um, have a significant enough developmental delay may be that they just haven't acquired the skill of, of playing imaginatively, like pretending that some, like, you know, uh, a pencil is a, a wand, for example. So that's imaginative play. And we know that that's actually something that sometimes our kids can have a difficult time with um, because of uh, intellectual disability. Our kids sometimes have repetitive play with objects. So that may be that that's just how they play and not necessarily that and that they don't know how else to play rather than um, that they're being repetitive in kind of an autistic um, presentation. Making friends can be difficult from a lot of different perspectives when you have Down syndrome. Um, you know, it might be that people don't understand what you're saying and so they don't give you the feedback that you want and so then you isolate more. Um, you know, our, our friends with Down syndrome talk to themselves sometimes, so that might be, you know, kind of something that makes social interactions a little more difficult too. Um, people with Down syndrome have this same type of insistence on sameness, maybe some challenges in flexibility in their routine. They might have difficulty with change. We see that more often in our population of people with Down syndrome, but because that's something we see in autism as well, we actually have to be really careful to make sure that we're differentiating where that um, where it's coming from and to what degree um, that the problem is presenting with. Patterns of behavior. So, our kids sometimes can have limited interests. Kids with Down syndrome can have sensory issues. And, you know, we have to say that in autism and Down syndrome, symptoms must be present prior to the age of three. Now, if we're thinking about it from that perspective, a lot of times because of our developmental delay, it might be that a person with Down syndrome just hasn't gained those skills yet instead of the fact that they won't develop um, or won't develop um, as much as the other skills that they have. So that that's an important thing to take into consideration. And so when we're really thinking about um, whether somebody has an autism and Down syndrome diagnosis, we have to think about, you know, uh, the order of development is happening at the same rate, but maybe just at a slower rate. So when we're thinking about that, 
this rate is going to be different from child to child. And that's why we have to be really careful with how we do the full evaluation. On top of all of those things, we know that people with Down syndrome have tons of medical comorbidities. And so are there symptoms presenting in a way that's actually more likely related to a medical condition or is it really autism? Is it a mental health issue or is it autism? Is it really challenges, significant enough challenges with their communication strategies or is it autism? And then we really know that that prefrontal cortex is responsible for a lot of executive function skills or things like I was saying, like planning, organizing, navigating social interactions, or is it just that the person has executive um, dysfunction instead of executive function that's intact, that's making them look like they have um, autism. So I'd like to kind of walk you through a little bit of what we look at when we're thinking about an assessment, if it's something that you are um, worried about. So the gold standard for um, diagnosing is really in a, a lot of different realms considered different for different um, people. So all of these measures, again, were not created specifically for Down syndrome. And I've already told you that there's a lot of overlap between the two. So that does make it a little bit more challenging to use these questionnaires because a lot of our kids are gonna flag as if they have autism on these questionnaires, even if they really don't. So for example, the social communication questionnaire um, has a question about, does your child have a back and forth conversation? Or does your child mix up their pronouns? These are all indicators of a person having autism, but that's actually not true in the Down syndrome population because we know that language is significantly impacted and communication significantly impacted in a person with Down syndrome. So what we do is we really look at these screening measures as the gold standards that we've evaluated at this point with research, but we really have to make sure that the, the screening measures in particular don't end up giving a diagnosis, that we do really thorough clinical history um, evaluation in person before we give a diagnosis. And I, I really encourage you to make sure that any provider that is doing a full evaluation you know, so many families tell me they spent 20 minutes with my kid and they said they had autism or they spent 20 minutes with my kid and they said they didn't have autism. You know, as you guys know, you should trust your gut and know that that is not a thorough evaluation and that much more needs to be done. And hopefully by me sharing what some of the measures are, you'll be able to kind of go, hey, oh, that sounds familiar or that's something that, you know, we we can consider. And these measures were really selected because they try to minimize the bias that we know comes with having Down syndrome. So some of the um, cognitive measures that you'll see in a little bit um, are not as language heavy. So it, you can respond by pointing. And that's important for our population because then we're not asking the person to actually verbalize something that maybe is in their head, but that they just can't produce with their speech. So screening questionnaires, we really use things like the social communication questionnaire, the social responsiveness scale, and something called the MCHAT, um, the Modified Checklist for Autism and Toddlers. For the gold standard in actually doing the full diagnosis, um, we really look at something called the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. And what this is, is a series of structured and semi-structured tasks that you put the child in and you really want to elicit specific responses from them. So I might like do a pretend birthday party and I'm gonna see how the child kind of continues in um, engaging in, in that birthday party or how they respond when I get burned from the, of the candle. So really we're doing these, this, we're putting them in a specific situation and then we would expect that if they had autism, they would react a certain way. And if they didn't have autism, they would react a certain way. And so we're putting those pieces together to then um, come up with a, um, a diagnosis or a, 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 an algorithm to kind of indicate that this might be something um, that is of concern. Some of the challenges related to the ADOS is, is that you have to have a nonverbal mental age of 15 months or older for the first module. So for our kids, because they have a developmental delay, we, they end up sometimes, you know, having people who are like, I'm not going to do the ADOS because um, they're not developmentally or have, they don't have a mental age of 15 months yet. And what I would say is, is that you can still gather information by doing this, but you just can't use the scoring algorithm. Um, you also have to be able to independently walk. And for a lot of our kids, that's significantly delayed as well. And so, you know, I am one of those people who I'm like, 
let's do the evaluation and let's take all the pieces together and let's see if we can still make a diagnosis because we don't want to wait until they walk to then give them a diagnosis just because somebody said, well, we can't use the scoring algorithm. This test was never meant to be like just a scoring algorithm. And it actually says like, you know, using it with other neurocognitive or neurodevelopmental um, conditions is not uh, gonna, you can't use this scoring algorithm. And so you do have to use the observations you get. But like anything else, if you put yourself in a situation and you gather information within that observation, that should really be enough information to then be able to make that diagnosis. It also says that you can't have significant hearing and vision impairment, which again, are areas that are of challenge for our kids. So um, again, I disagree that you can't, that you, I think you can still use the ADOS too, but you will come across a lot of people who are like, well, we just can't evaluate them for these reasons. And I would really encourage you to be um, your child's best advocate and and push push them to um, to do it or to find somebody else who will. Um, the autism diagnostic interview. So if a person can't necessarily participate in the ADOS, this is a very lengthy interview with parents that's asking very detailed questions about their development um, from birth till whatever age they are, and it goes through kind of what their skills are within the um, criteria that that are used to diagnose autism. But again, you have to have a mental age of at least 18 months. So then we always get additional information by using like an IQ test because um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But the things that we tend to use are um, these measures that are here. You don't have to remember all of them. Um, the Bailey and the Stanford Binet are favorites in the Down syndrome research world and probably fairly similarly the favorites in clinical practice. Um, people will use the other measures on this list, but those are the ones that have been more researched as not having kind of an added bias when you have a person with Down syndrome that's participating in um, this type of evaluation. We also use adaptive measures. Different from IQ measures, adaptive measures are kind of a, a caregiver rating, a parent rating, like how you know how are they doing with self-feeding skills? How are they doing with bathing? How are they doing with um, you know, dressing themselves. So it's a lot of like daily function questions. Um, and, you know, you may have, if your child is older, may have already experienced filling one of these out for an annual IEP um, to be able to gather that information as well. So this is like, what are you actually able to do in your day-to-day -day functioning? Whereas IQ is kind of more uh, an op option of looking at your global cognitive function. We also use language measures to kind of really evaluate how a person is communicating, um, and these are some examples of that too. So the most important thing that we have to take into consideration is when I'm looking at a child with a known developmental delay, so looking at a child with Down syndrome and saying, hmm, do they have autism as well? We're always asking the question, are their social skills and communication skills more delayed than the rest of their skills? So it's not, you know, if you have a child who's really kind of delayed in all of their skills equally, that is not autism. What we say is, is and that's why we have to do IQ, language, why we're doing all these other tests um, as well, because we're trying to say if all of them are kind of following, falling into the same kind of realm of skill set, that's not autism. That is just overall global developmental delay or developmental disability. If their social skills are much more impacted than the rest of their skills, that's what we identify as autism. And so we do have to look at when do social and communication skills typically develop? This is actually when we, um, when these skills develop for a child who does not have Down syndrome. Unfortunately, we have not been doing a good job on having broad scale studies where we can kind of capture prospectively when kids, um, you know, acquire these skills. So what we really need is, is somebody to take, uh, you know, meet with a bunch of families and get all of their baby books and, you know, write down when certain things were achieved. Because when we ask about those, um, those skills when they come into clinic, they're trying to remember something from the past, which makes it much less accurate versus when they were actually writing it down when it happened. And so we don't have the same types of, um, you know, communicate, when does social communication develop for kids with Down syndrome that for a large um, number of kids. So it's hard for us to even gauge when that is, which is why we really look at the clinical presentation.
So when are we concerned about autism um, in Down syndrome? I'm going to give you the things that I really, you know, broad strokes of what I look at. So if there's rare attempts to imitate others, so like, you know, uh, pretending if I'm pretending to brush my teeth and the child isn't pretending, you know, doing the same imitation, or if I try to blow a kiss and I want them to do it and they're not imitating me, if there's rare attempts to imitate others, that's something that's going to be a red flag for me. Because imitation tends to be a strength for kids with Down syndrome. A tendency not to share emotions by directing their facial expressions to others. So a lot of times I'll see kids who come in and they're smiling and they're, they seem like very, very happy, but they're not actually turning their face to a person to communicate with them that I'm having this emotion, right? So they might be kind of in their own world, smiling at themselves or laughing to themselves, but they're not directing that communication or that emotion towards somebody else. And so that's something that then becomes a red flag for me. If there's quote unquote disconnect between what the child is experiencing and what's going on around them. So say like, you know, there's, you're in a loud room and a bunch of kids are crying. And then the one child with Down syndrome is, you know, um, maybe like looking at their hands and just smiling and laughing to themselves and not looking at their environment. That disconnect of, oh my gosh, everybody in the room is crying. It's not, I mean, I don't want, you know, my child to be crying too, but if they're not aware of the emotions that the other people in the room are experiencing to kind of even be confused about why people might be crying, um, that's something that would be a red flag. This word is really, really important, intentionality. When we think about communication, communication is most powerful when it's functional, meaning that it is used to get something to protest something, to communicate something. So the, here's an example of a communication. Like if I say, okay, how does your child communicate? And a family tells me they use single words, they use sign language, um, they, you know, they, um, you know, use phrases, whatever. To me, that's wonderful. That's great to have that communication. But say that the child is requesting milk and they're standing at the fridge and just repeatedly saying milk, 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 or signing it, right? But they're not turning and actually getting, you know, communicating it to a person who can actually help them get what they need. That's a lack of intentionality. So that means that my communication is not as functional. It's not as useful if I'm not directing it towards what we call a communication partner. We're not directing it towards somebody else to be able to like pull us in and then get that information to us. So I, you know, it's, this is kind of hopefully giving you an idea of why the questions have to be much more detailed than just how do they communicate? Because if I said that and somebody told me they sign, they, they use words, I might say, great. But if I don't ask the second question about intentionality, then I might not necessarily have the answer to the question I'm really looking for, which is, are they really communicating with a communication partner? Social communication and orient orienting skills that are below the child's other skills. So again, you know, how much are they intentionally communicating? And it doesn't just have to be when they want something or are requesting something. It can be even protesting, right? So it's, do I look at the person and I say no? Or do I run away from them and then turn and look to see if they're coming, you know, following me? So those social communications and orienting to a person's skills are below all of the other skills that they have. What other things do we see? Lack of shared enjoyment with others. So I might be having really fun with like a, a stimming toy, something that spins or something that I'm shaking, but I'm not turning and showing it to you as well, right? Like I'm just enjoying it by myself. That's a concern, red flag. Few attempts to communicate verbally or non-verbally. So not pointing, you know, we know our kids have a communication challenge, but if they're not trying to find other ways of communicating, that's really concerning. I had a, fit, a, a adolescent who, uh, you know, had beautiful nonverbal communication skills. He had maybe like two words or so, maybe not even that, but he used gestures and facial expressions and, you know, like body language to be able to communicate what it was that he wanted to tell me about his favorite topic, which was um, shark movies. Um, and so to me, like, it's it's overcoming or finding other ways to communicate your needs 
when you don't have um, the same means that uh, another person might who doesn't have that same level of expressive communication challenge. If we see somebody making unusual vocalizations, again, with the absence of functional communication. So if we have somebody who is non-speaking or who doesn't have words yet, and they're going, ah, nah, 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 nah. to me, that's not of concern. Like that prosody or the change in, in kind of like their tone and the fact that they're looking at somebody and babbling, to me, that's not of concern. That's still functional communication. It's, it's attempting, even though I don't have the words yet. Unusual vocalizations are usually like monotone, so flat. You might hear like ba 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 or eh, like something that's very very monotone and is not looking at anybody. It's kind of like again to myself, and it doesn't have kind of a clear purpose. So that would be a red flag. If you see a change in functioning or a loss of skills, that's quite concerning. So it's not you know, as pronounced, it's not as pr uh, pronounced of a uh, observation in kids with um, autism, but you definitely do see that if somebody loses their language skills or, you know, even stops communicating, so they had a burst of communication, a burst of language, and then they just stopped using it, that's of concern. And again, these are, are um, red flags. Um, and when there's not another explanation, you know, as I've kind of um, said, there are some other reasons that a person might have, um, you know, behaviors that present like autism, but it might not be autism. So another thing, if a person has repetitive motor um, behaviors, that's going to be something that's a red flag. So if they're repetitively like shaking something or if they're repetitively rocking or jumping and flapping, Jumping and flapping is actually developmental, so lots of kids do it when they're really, really young. Um, but this kind of has a more intense quality, and it doesn't seem, again, directed at anybody or engaged with anybody. We know speech difficulties can be a partial red flag. If they're rigid in their behavior, that's also a, a red flag. But important to know that these behaviors, repetitive motor behaviors, speech difficulties, and behavior rigidity, you know, we see that so much in people with Down syndrome who don't have autism. And so we really need to do more research um, in understanding if there are differences in intensity and pervasiveness of these behaviors in people who have both conditions. I can tell you anecdotally from in my experience clinically that people who have these repetitive motor behaviors, the intensity is much more um, intense. Um, and it's hard to disengage from it. So if a person with Down syndrome walks into my office and they have, you know, a sock tends to be a favorite shaking toy, but if they have a sock and they're shaking it and um, they're shaking it and the parent, and I'm talking to the parents, but then I turn and, and say, Joey, and they stop stimming and they directly, you know, engage with me or they come over to me, I'm not going to be as concerned. If I call for them or if I try to engage with them and they just continue to stim and they just stay in that repetitive behavior, that's going to be much more concerning because it means that they're not even recognizing that there is a partner or or a person um, that's trying to engage with them. So we do need more research with these specific areas. We also know behavior rigidity or like, you know, not wanting things to be different or having trouble with transitions. All of those things are things that are common in Down syndrome, even if you don't have autism. So um, it's, you know, kind of these are like partial red flags, but not um, in alone. I wouldn't be as concerned. So we also have to think about what are the other reasons why the person might be presenting the way they are. Down syndrome. It might just be related to the skills that they have and the skills that they don't have related to having Down syndrome. It might be something that's a mental health issue. Do they have depression? Do they have anxiety? It might be related to the severity of their communication um, difficulties. I had a person with um, Down syndrome who had actually a reverse profile so they expressively could say a lot but they would imitate a ton of things that other people said but their receptive language was not as good so they they weren't understanding things that i was saying and a lot of people thought that the person looked like they had autism but when we evaluated her from a communication standpoint we discovered that it was actually that she wasn't really understanding the vast majority of what people were communicating to her and that when we really reduced the language demands um, all of a sudden, these beautiful social skills came out because um, she understood what we were um, communicating. And so she wasn't just kind of engaged in her own world at that point. 
I already mentioned executive function um, issues, so I, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but these are just other presentation considerations. And then just environmental. We know that, you know, in the general population, kids who have been adopted or who have been in abusive um, households prior to, you know, moving to a more stable environment, um, that that can actually present also like autis autism or autistic um, features. And so we have to make sure that we are asking all of the questions related to the environment as well. And then medical issues. So what are the implications? The clinical relevance is that families and clinicians, you know, really report that kids who have Down syndrome and autism have a very distinct phenotype, meaning like they present differently. So this really may impact how they respond to interventions, how the stressors in the family may, um, you know, come about, what the outcomes might be. In fact, most families will tell me that, you know, they feel more comfortable functioning in kind of the autism world if their child is duly diagnosed than functioning in the Down syndrome world because they feel like the level of challenges that they encounter are just much different than, um, than what the Down syndrome community faces. You know, we have this popular stereotype that all oh, people with Down syndrome are super friendly and social. And, you know, we just have to really recognize that that's inaccurate. And I think that it can be a pretty big grief process for families when they do realize that maybe their child doesn't fit with that, um, you know, temperament or if, if that secondary diagnosis does um, present itself. But the whole point of getting a diagnosis or really evaluating that is to really recognize what is the best way that my child or my loved one will learn and then how do we really um, you know uh, move people in understanding that in a better way so there's lots of different treatments for autism you probably have heard of applied behavioral analysis um, it's evidence-based for aut all of these are going to be evidence-based for autism there's really not much, sadly, um, there's not much at all for evidence-based um, interventions for people with um, Down syndrome because uh, we just haven't gotten funding to do research within that avenue. What I can anecdotally tell you is, is that all of these things are things that I wish we could have for um, kids who have Down syndrome who don't have autism too, because I do see that understanding why a behavior is happening and then fixing the underlying reason is gonna be what changes the behavior. So applied behavioral analysis, there's different kinds. The one that people are kind of very scared about and really don't like is called discrete trial training. That's really the oldest version of ABA. So that's where you're sitting across from somebody on a desk and you're repeatedly presenting them with something and you're waiting for a response and you give them a cookie if they respond correctly or you give them time to play with a toy, but it's at a table and it's very intense. That's not the type of ABA that most people do or most companies provide at this point. Um, because we recognize that that's not, you know, the way most people will learn. It needs to be in a more natural environment. So pivotal response training and the Early Start Denver model are two other, um, you know, programs that are based on ABA, but really are much more flexible in how they um, are presented. And it's really about following the child's lead, but then still placing demands that um, require the child to request something, for example. So it might be something like, I'm going to, um, you know, uh, put their favorite toy up high on a shelf in a clear box so that they have to, you know, have an opportunity to request it, right? Um, if they can just access it all the time by themselves, then they're not going to ever practice requesting because they can just get it themselves. So it's about putting the, you know, changing the environment to like, be conducive to then kids really gravitating towards what's interesting to them and then us following their lead to be able to actually um, get them to practice those other skills we want them to have, like requesting, protesting, um, you know, uh, following directions, things like that. There's another structured teaching approach that's um, called TEACH. It's out of Chapel Hill, and it is um, a program that I actually really love for the reason that it really makes things very clear. So it it presents information from the standpoint of how do we change the environment? How do we make cl clear, predictable routines and repetition so that the person feels less anxious, less anxious and is able to be as independent as possible? I'm not going to have time to go into these into too much detail, but again, I'm giving these to you so that you have when you have the slides, you can research them a little bit more yourself if that's something that is of interest. And then floor time is probably um, the most, it, it's 
evidence-based, but it's more relaxed than the other ones are. So it's very much child-led. And then some people go for complementary and alternative interventions. Unfortunately, there's again, not a lot of research on this, but people will change diets. Um, people will take supplements. People will do all kinds of, you know, go to a naturopath. People will do all kinds of things, um, you know, to help support decrease of the symptoms of autism. And I can't honestly tell you whether they all work or not, because I will tell you that some families will tell me, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe what a change I noticed. And other people say, you know, I, it didn't do anything. And what I always say is, is that it's really important to weigh the pros and cons and to recognize that sometimes complementary and alternative interventions can actually do harm that we don't recognize because um, we think it's natural but um, that that's all things that you should talk to, you know, a pediatrician or a primary care doctor about. When we're talking generally about a learning environment for a person with Down syndrome and autism, um, really we have to think about things like minimizing distractions when learning a new skill. Um, minimizing that distraction really allows the person to hone in on what it is that we're trying to teach them. Now, a lot of these things you're going to say, well, is, aren't these things that are, you know, good for any child? And I would say yes, but they're especially true for um, a person who has Down syndrome and autism um, when you are trying to uh, make sure that you're minimizing anything that might be a challenge. Um, we frequently reassess motivators and reinforcers. So just learning is hard. And for a number of different reasons, it can be even more challenging for somebody who has autism and Down syndrome. So we frequently have to kind of really recognize what are the motivators and then what are the reinforcers or what are the things that might be more motivating um, for that person? And as you know, people change, so their interests will change over time too. And if we don't stay ahead of the motivators and reinforcers, we'll end up finding um, ourselves in some pretty challenging situations. Using clear visual strategies more than verbal auditory strategies. Again, something that we know from that hippocampal um, functioning that if we can't uh, remember what somebody tells us, it is really important to have those visual supports to be able to reference at a later point in time. We want to use errorless learning strategies. This is one that I really love and I think that is underutilized which is in typical nature, we say, let kids make a mistake and then they'll learn from their mistake. For kids with Down syndrome and for kids with Down syndrome and autism, utilizing an errorless learning strategy where we're teaching it to them correctly is actually much more effective because if we're teaching them and they keep making the same mistake over and over and over again, they're gonna really get into a muscle memory situation of the incorrect way to do it. And it takes longer than to teach them the correct way to do it. We wanna teach intentional requesting and functional communication. So again, if I want something, how do I direct my attention towards a specific communication partner? So a person, instead of just kind of requesting to the world and waiting for somebody to respond. I'll sometimes use that as an example um, when I'm talking to families too. I'll say, do you, you know, does your child, you know, like, you know, use whatever communication that strategies they have and kind of share with the world and then hope somebody responds? Or do they go up to somebody and they actually um, engage and request for that um, person to then help them with whatever they're needing help with? We want to teach in context. So we don't want to teach, you know, like social stories are a great way to teach kids, like help them understand what the expectations are going to be. But then we want to actually practice it in the situation, in the environment, in order for that to really become um, much easier to process and to you know, take, take into consideration. Research shows that more direct intervention in social and communication, social skills and communication, with an emphasis on that piece that I was telling you, the functional piece and pre-verbal communication will actually increase overall skill development. So we want to really focus on what are those pre-verbal communication skills? What are the gestures? What are the ways in which we communicate even before we have words? And then how can we really use that in a very functional way? Children with Down syndrome and autism need active facilitated social support with peers. So, you know, really this is kind of the whole situation. Well, if the person with Down syndrome and autism is in a classroom setting, for example, and in their own world, they're not causing any trouble. But unfortunately, then they're not learning the skill of how do I engage with people in a more comfortable way. And so un until we have somebody who's kind of actively involved in that process, we're not going to be able to teach those skills, which is how, you know, 
as you know, that's how our kids learn. So it's important for us to be able to, you know, make sure that um, we're exposing our kids to that type of an environment. Research show, shows that children with Down syndrome and autism need a planful approach to teaching skills that fill in the developmental gaps. So the skills that they're lacking, they might need more time for teaching like intentional requesting. We have to spend additional time for that specific skill. They may need visual supports and predictable routines. Again, that just helps them kind of, again, use something that may seem like a challenge, their rigidity, and turn it into something positive by saying, well, if we can make it a rigidity related to something that we want them to do, then that actually works to um, everyone's advantage. And then overall interventions designed, designed for children with autism are usually a better fit than anything that's designed specifically for a person with Down syndrome. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, more research is needed to understand which interventions are appropriate for people with Down syndrome and autism because not a lot of funding and research has been done in that arena. Um, I will say that we actually um, just received funding um, in September of this year to um, do a five-year study on early markers of um, of autism in Down syndrome. So we're going to actually be evaluating infants, um, you know, across uh, several years to be able to determine what, you know, who are the kids who really do end up developmentally looking like they um, have autism and what were the red flags that we could maybe recognize even earlier. Because a lot of times kids with Down syndrome get um, diagnosed with autism at a much later age than what it would be for the general population. Clinicians and researchers say that understanding the function of a behavior really matters. So why is the behavior occurring? Is it because of a communication breakdown? Is it because of sensory issues? What is the reason? And that that's going to also help us differentiate between Down syndrome and autism. We really need to um, embedding motivators within the context of a, a routine drives learning. We know that. So if we can do that at, from an intervention standpoint, that's actually going to help us a lot with being able to shape behaviors as well. So it's like saying first we're going to do this hard thing and then you can have a break. Right. And sometimes the most motivating thing is time by themselves for a person with autism and Down syndrome versus somebody who has just Down syndrome. So a reward for a person with Down syndrome might be doing something socially with a person, whereas for a person with Down syndrome and autism, it might be um, having, like I said, that time by themselves. So that's why the diagnosis also matters a lot. Um, what is that motivation? We really want to teach leader skills too, um, so that we can in encourage social engagement around those things. So sometimes we might say, oh, we want to teach kids to like be excited about something that their peers are excited about. Unfortunately, that might actually be much more difficult than saying, can we see what that child's interest is? And then can we teach other people to engage with them around what their special interest is? And then, like I mentioned before, actively facilitating those social supports with peers with things that are really motivating for that person with Down syndrome and autism so that we can teach those social skills that are uh, much more impacted uh, for a person who has Down syndrome and autism. Repetition and practice doing a skill correctly really works best, as I have shared. So what are we what are we saying? Minimizing distractors when learning new skills helps. This may mean that they might need one one on one or small group instructions. Even in your home, it might be that when you're teaching, uh, you might, you know, sometimes we might use a sibling as a model. But for a person with Down syndrome and autism, they might need that one on one attention instead. Individualized visual support approach to developing literacy skills really has been shown to um, have the most growth and a strength based approach is needed for learning new skills. You, these are going to look familiar to you, but I want to just highlight some of the key aspects of what actually really works with kids with Down syndrome and autism as well as what we see in just even the Down syndrome population. So we know that setting events, or we know that there are things outside of what might be happening right in the moment that impact behavior. So a success, a way to provide success um, for a person with Down syndrome and autism is understanding what are the other factors outside of just the immediate moment that can impact their behaviors. It could mean medical issues. It could mean changes in a routine. It might be their sleep issues. It might be like sleep pattern issues. But if those things um, are happening and 
impact a person's um, behavior the next day, we want to make sure that we understand that so that we can um, really adjust our expectations on that day. So if a family is communicating that a child had a really terrible sleep or they've been struggling with sleep for the past week, we're going to know that we're going to have to change how we engage with them um, on the opposite end, um, you know, to maybe have more frequent breaks um, during the day uh, so that we're not getting kind of complete refusal or complete disengagement. You've heard people talk about visual schedules even more important with a person who has Down syndrome and autism because they need clear, predictable routines. This allows for repetition. It also, you know, if orienting or making eye contact with a person feels too intense, having a visual schedule can actually be a great way to really be able to relay the expectations in a way that highlights a strength of a person with Down syndrome and autism versus um, trying to force something that, you know, doesn't come as naturally. And then we can really embed the motivators right in here. Like what, you know, what do they like to do that we can visually represent in between the things that are hard for them to do? When we're teaching a new skill, we talk about filling developmental gaps. We always want to assess what is their skill level right now. We want to use errorless learning. We want to minimize distractions and we want to teach it in the context. We won't have time to go into this, but I do a whole talk on independence and how to work towards independence. And I actually think that this is true again for a person with Down syndrome and autism as well. We want to be able to say, what are the skills you already have? And then what level of prompting do I need to do in order for me to be able to help support you with completing that task? And then we want to move more and more towards the less restrictive, more independent side. Timers are a great strategy. Again, a visual way of representing something that's too abstract for somebody who might have an intellectual disability that's much more significant. Significant. So visual timers really like help a person to say, you know, like in this first image with the duck, you'd say when the picture appears, that's when time is up. That's much easier to understand than saying we're leaving in five minutes. And so anytime we can make these things more concrete, that's again going to be a tool that's even more powerful for a person with Down syndrome and autism. Constantly reevaluating what somebody's motivators are is really, really important. And recognizing that for people with Down syndrome and autism, their motivators might be very different from anybody else. I'd actually say that even for kids with Down syndrome alone, um, that they have interests that are very different. But sometimes, you know, their interests might be spinny globes or things that vibrate or um uh musical toys or things cause and effect type of things so it may feel like oh they don't have any interest but what i would challenge you to do is just present them with a lot of different options and then sit back and just see what they gravitate towards because that's how you're going to be able to learn what is interesting um and they're not you know a lot of our kids aren't going to say hey can you give me something to play with um and so we do have to kind of test it out in a, in a different way. We have to present lots of options and then see which one um, would get selected. Token boards are another great strategy for helping to build momentum around behaviors. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna be able to go into too much detail about it. I wanna save some time for questions, but one that is used in many different contexts. For a person with Down syndrome, Token boards work just as effectively as for a person with Down syndrome and autism. But for a person with Down syndrome and autism, what added you know, piece we might add is we might make a token board look like something that's of their particular interest. So the one on the right shows a zoo image and then zoo animals that go into the token board. And that was created for a child who specifically had kind of this obsessive interest in, um, in zoos and in and, and zoo animals. And so it's, you know, it's, not just the motivation for doing the thing we're asking them to do, but also for getting tokens that represent something that's of primary interest. So when we think about social communication and support, we want to think about what are the ways that we want to teach that. So we want more direct intervention and in social communication with an emphasis on that functional piece. We want more time teaching things like intentional requesting. Intentional requesting is basically like, again, what I was saying, if I'm saying milk and I'm facing the fridge, I might make it so that the person can't eventually just get the milk themselves. I might be just putting my hand on the door and holding it, holding it, holding it. Um, and as they're signing milk, I, you know, waiting until they either direct their 
eye contact to me or until they like turn their body towards me and then sign milk. And then I say, oh, you want milk and then give it to them. So we're basically shaping that behavior by really making sure that that request is much more functional than um, just kind of communicating to the world. Some of these are ones that I've already kind of gone over, so I don't want to um, beat a dead horse with that. So. Um, we want to teach emotion regulation. We talked about how the prefrontal cortex is responsible for that piece in, in you know, kind of navigating day-to-day um, -day interactions. But I think that making things, again, more concrete it can be really helpful for kids with Down syndrome and autism. So helping them to know, like, what does it mean to be calm? These are the four criteria. You know, what what makes me happy and how do I show in my, with my behaviors what it indicates happiness, especially for kids who have a really hard time, you know, understanding or labeling, you know, what types of situations elicit those emotions or even where they come from. This is an important piece for kids with Down syndrome and autism. And then when you're addressing specific functional behaviors, we want to look at why is the behavior occurring? So we've talked about all these global things that we want to address related to a person with Down syndrome and autism, but just like any other population, whether it be Down syndrome, whether it's autism, whether it's ADHD, whether it's, you know, um, somebody who has mood dysregulation, we always want to understand why the behavior is happening. And we really have evidence that shows that knowing this can actually help a person with Down syndrome and autism function a lot be um, better in their environment. Because what we can do is we can say, oh, you want attention? Here's how you get attention. You want this tangible item? Here's how you get it. And so we're really teaching that functional piece through recognition of these things. This is just a little thing that I created many, many years ago um, when I work with families to help them to really identify what is going on in a situation. So I have them write the observed behavior in the red box. Then in the yellow boxes, they'll write, you know, what are the possible reasons why that behavior is happening? And then in the green box, we'll write solutions for how are we going to address that behavior? Again, I teach this to people who have children with Down syndrome or who have Down syndrome and autism because I think it's equally effective because communication problems are broad scale. It's not just for one population, it's for both. And so if we can get better at um, helping with that level of communication, then we can actually um, you know, identify what the underlying issue is and then we can come up with a better solution. So here's just an example. So hitting when approached by another person, that could be to escape, like you don't want, you know, you're trying to escape the situation. It could be that it's sensory seeking. It could be that you have a skill deficit and you don't know, you know, how to tell somebody stop. It could be that you want what they have, or it could be that you want attention. Attention tends to be a, a less likely option for a person with Down syndrome and autism. But again, we want to put that on there if there is if it is an option. And then we would come up with, oops, sorry. Then we would come up with what are the strategies we would use to address the behaviors that we see in yellow. Okay. I just hope I shared with you a ton of information. I'm going to stop screen sharing so that I can maybe see people and maybe um, answer some questions either about the presentation or, you know, um, even uh, just about Down syndrome and autism. Dr. Patel, thank you so much. That was phenomenal. Um, and I love how eloquently and articulately you speak about the subject. Um, there you. are a there are a few questions in the Q&A, and I will uh -huh. just come in here and go through them um, for you. Yeah. Um, one of the questions was, has there been any study for adults with Down syndrome for a dual diagnosis? No, there has not. And it's uh, really um, such a huge challenge because a lot of times when adults with Down syndrome are uh, if they're if they've been doing fairly well um, on kind of a day to day basis, people don't recognize that autism was there and present, you know, from a very young age until it becomes more challenging to engage with them as an adult. So they might even never get a diagnosis. Unfortunately, um, we try really hard to make sure that we're keeping an open mind about um, the fact that that 
you know, can happen and trying to do better with diagnosing it in adulthood. But uh, I mean, I am very sad to say that there's actually not much that's been done on the adult side. And as we know, with Down syndrome in general, there hasn't been as much research. Um, we're very fortunate in the last few years um, yep. that we've come out with the adult um, Down syndrome healthcare guidelines. Yep. So we're making some progress, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, um, and just so you know that we're doing an updated version of the adult guidelines um, just started. I'm actually on that committee with Global Down Syndrome Foundation. So hopefully we'll have kind of a um, updated version. And we do have handouts that I can actually send to you guys as well that um, I'm a member of the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group, which is and I'm on the board for them. And it's an organization of people who specialize in working with people with Down Syndrome. And many years ago, because of my passion for kids with Down Syndrome and autism, um, we created kind of a, a work group um, where we've published together on Down syndrome and autism. We've, um, you know, proposed research projects and we actually created educational handouts um, for providers. And we actually have an adult version as well. So I can send those um, to you, Donna, to uh, share with the group. Thank you. That would be great. We also have a lot of this information available for download on the NCDSA website, both for healthcare providers as well as families. Um, and just to put a plug in here, um, there is the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group also hosts a monthly Project ECHO, which for yep. people that are not aware of that, that is a project based um, learning out of the University of New Mexico, where it's kind of like an all teach, all learn. Um, but it's this one is dedicated to Down syndrome. So there's typically a didactic where someone presents on a specific topic and then a specific case will be presented. And the people who are involved in the ECHO will ask clarifying questions and then make recommendations for that case. Um, so that's been happening not quite a year. I think the first one just started this spring in 2023. So that's a, a fabulous resource. And I do I did notice that the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group has, um, I believe, the didactics posted on their website. Um, yeah. So thank thank you for bringing up um, Disney. They're a fabulous resource. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's see. My son has sensory issues and has PICA, which is related mostly to autism, but looks like he doesn't have a lot of the red flags that you mentioned. So now I'm confused. We want we went to one child psychologist and he said that, yes, my son has autism. Should we look, look for a second opinion? I would honestly say it depends on if you feel that the diagnosis is not accurate. The having sensory issues in PICA alone are not, you know, indicative of having autism. <clears throat> that could be for a lot of different reasons. We know that um, a lot of kids with Down syndrome alone have sensory processing issues. So to me, that's not a red flag per se. The pica is a little bit different, but we've actually seen some kids who have things related to nutrition. Um, and I actually do feeding therapy with these amazing uh, feeding therapists and MDs that specialize in feeding. And so sometimes um, a, a lack of a specific nutrient or mineral can result in um, eating non-food items too, or not understanding what's food and what's not. So to me, like, if you are questioning and going, he's so socially related, or based on my presentation today, if the red flags that I said are red flags, you're like, he doesn't have any of those red flags, I would go and have a second opinion. Um, if you think that the things that I pointed out as red flags are red flags for your child, then probably the diagnosis is, is more accurate. I will say there's very few of us in the country who specialize in Down syndrome and then have this specialty in autism as well. So you're not gonna, I see in the chat that there are people who are asking about recommendations for diagnose, uh, places to get tested. And I would say your best bet is gonna be to, look at autism specific providers. So look in your network for people who evaluate autism, and that's gonna be a, a much more likely option than finding somebody who understands Down syndrome and autism. Um, like I said, there's very, very few psychologists who um, specialize in that arena. Thank you. Um, do you see some of the other issues that those on the spectrum also have, like gut and digestion problems, sleep issues in those with both Down syndrome and autism? Yes, 
we see them quite often. I don't think there's been a ton of research that's differentiated um, the group of people with Down syndrome from the group of people with Down syndrome, Down syndrome and autism. Um, we are looking at those medical comor comorbidities, but we actually see such significant um, percentages of sleep disorders and disruptive sleep in people with Down syndrome that it's hard to then look at the population of Down syndrome and autism and not assume that a large percentage of them would have the same. I would maybe say that maybe it's more severe on some level, like I early waking tends to be, I mean, just this is my clinical ex experience, not research based, but I would say I feel like kids who have Down syndrome and autism, if they do have sleep issues, it tends to be more severe in that the consequences are greater. So I had a kiddo who woke up in the middle of the night and tried to make popcorn, but didn't take the plastic off and almost burned the house down. So, you know, like those types of things of like lack of time or lack of awareness that seem to be even more pronounced for a person who has Down syndrome and autism um, both. Thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations on continuing education for a therapist on treatment interventions for kids with Down syndrome and autism in early intervention and school age? And she loved the ideas you already had today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think having them participate in DISMIG's Project ECHO, I think that that's a big um, area or resource. There's also... Um, you know, I, I actually we're we're working on this. We have a page on um, Autism Speaks. I know that I'm just going to say it out there that it's a little controversial. I know people aren't, um, you know, super fans of Autism Speaks, but they were very generous in allowing us to actually have a page specifically about Down syndrome and autism and um, and also providing, um, you know, if you call them providing resources for being able to to um, go out and, you know, um, and uh, find resources within their area. But I would actually say that if they're looking, that eventually what we're going to be doing, which I'm, I know isn't really giving you an answer to your question, which I apologize for, but um, we are planning on actually posting videos of what Down syndrome and autism look like different from just Down syndrome. And so I, I, I'm hopeful that that can actually be up and running fairly quickly to be a teaching tool. But I think in the meantime, it, really looking towards the autism features is gonna be your best bet. Most things are narrative. I don't know about you guys, I'm quite, I really like videos because I think it shows me something much better than a verbal explanation. Um, but I think that uh, that's something that um, we're hopeful will be up and running fairly soon. Thank you. And they can call me. They can, <laughs> if you have a person who has a specific question, I am always so happy to, um, you know, Donna, you're welcome to share my email address with um, people on the call. I, I'm always happy to provide education, to share resources, to really try to, to help other people to understand what this looks like and to come to, you know, the right conclusion for our families so that um, we're really, you know, providing intervention as early as possible. And um, we happen to have uh, Jennifer Mahan, who is the um, Director of Public Policy. I apologize, Jen, if I got that wrong, at the Autism Society of North Carolina. And she has been sharing resources in the chat that I've been copying and will include in the follow-up email. And she says that one of their resources Resource specialists, the Autism Society of North Carolina can work with us and any of our participants to identify places that can diagnose for autism. Um, and for adults, they have a page on diagnosis issues as well. And so, like I said, I have copied all these links and we'll share them in the follow up email. Um, so we do have some new technology and I am trying to make sure that I am keeping up with everything. Um, in the chat box and as well as in the q and I think we are up to date with everything. I know I have uh, my coworker, Betsy John Lane, our family support specialist, working in the background, um, making sure that we are keeping up with everything. Um, so right now it looks like we're current with all the q and um, Yes. We got again, the chat and Q&A and nothing came through on text. So I just want to thank you again for your time with us tonight. Thank you, Betsy John. I want to thank everyone for their patience, um, especially if you had any complications logging on tonight. Um, I know that Dr. Patel was very patient with us, making sure everything was working properly um, before we admitted um, guests to the meeting.
Um, I would like to doc thank Dr. Patel for sharing her expertise on a, a Wednesday night um, in the middle of the winter. I can only imagine <laughs> what the weather is like in Colorado right now. Um, th those of us here in North Carolina are fretting because like, oh my gosh, it was like 28 degrees last night. <laughs> And we had I, a, I'm looking out the window and I see snow flurries. So it's, um, you know, we, we've actually had a milder winter than um, typical, but yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's especially since winter, winter hasn't started yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, again, I, I wanna... send the snow to North Carolina, Dr. Patel, send the snow. <laughs> I'm, I'm sending it, send it anyway. I'm going to cut <laughs> Betsy John's mic off now. <laughs> if I knew how to do that, apparently. I don't have all the features that I need to have with what I'm using here. Um, so I would just like to remind everybody that the North Carolina Downtown Virtual Speaker Series is typically the third Wednesday of the month. Um, January, we have skin conditions and Down syndrome with Dr. Jillian Rourke. And then in February, we have promoting mental health throughout the lifespan for injuries with Down syndrome with um, Abby Rowley, with licensed clinical social worker. I also wanna make sure everybody knows that the North Carolina Down syndrome conference will be coming up in April on the 27th at Alamance Community College. Um, registration will open up towards the end of January. And we have one of Dr. Patel's colleagues, Dr. Brian Chicoin with the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group and the Adult Down Syndrome Clinic in Park Ridge, Illinois. He will be our keynote speaker talking about healthcare bias for people with Down syndrome, which is especially important because the last couple of months, the National Institute of Health has designated that people with Down syndrome, I'm gonna get this wrong now, people with disabilities have been recognized um, with healthcare disparities. And one of the things this will do, we hope, will open up research funding so that we could look at more of those disparities and how it impacts people with disabilities as well as Down syndrome. So. Yes. I will stop putting in plugs for anything. I will thank Dr. Patel again and thank everyone for joining us on this Wednesday evening. It does look, I think the last chat was Betsy John saying thank you. So everyone have a great evening. We will follow up with an email next week and please do take barely a minute to complete the evaluation link that was in the, the email that went out to you with today's link. I'll plug the uh, yes. evaluation too, because I always love hearing um, if you if you know participants are getting the information that they're hoping for, or if there's things mm -hmm. that we can you know even I can do differently um, to uh, make sure that uh, you get what you need. Okay, thank you yes. so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.